afternoon and welcome to the Singola Zone. It is Tuesday, February 25th, 2014. This is Deanna Singola and this weekly program is sponsored by the American Free Press whose website is America, AmericanFreePress.net. I am a subscriber to the American Free Press and recommend a subscription to that newspaper as well as to the wonderful historical journal, The Barnes Review, whose website is barnesreview.org. That's B-A-R-N-E-S, barnesreview.org. Please visit both websites. Support the efforts of the people who report accurate history and contemporary events. Be sure to look at the limited quantity sale which comes with a free digital subscription. All righty. My websites are Spingola.com and SpingolaSpeaks.info. During the program, email your questions or comments to comment at Spingola.com. Unfortunately, my main computer is in the shop getting repaired from a cyber attack. So if you've emailed me to my regular email, I didn't get it, so... Hopefully, I will be getting my computer back today. During um, The U.S. government, a corporation, exists and functions solely for the purpose of protecting other corporations, those in which it invests huge sums of money. Every government agency, including but not limited to the CIA, the FBI, the CDC, the FDA, the U.S. military, the Patent and Trademark Office, and hundreds of other agencies, exist to protect the corporations. The government also shields and defends occupational labor unions such as the AMA. In addition to using military force to assist corporations, the government has instituted trade agreements beginning with Israel in 1985 with the Israel-United States Free Trade Agreement. We all know <coughs> excuse me, about the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, uh, congressional bribery about the North American Free Trade Agreement, uh, known as Pork Barrel Promises, totaled $50 billion. By January 1, 1991, 1999, due to NAFTA, U.S. job losses amounted to 600,000. There are dozens of other trade agreements, all of which benefit corporations in search of cheap or in this country, slave labor, such as in the privatized corporate prison industry. The government allows corporations to fluoridate the water, put aspartame in your food, and heaven only knows what else, in addition to creating GMO crops. The U.S. government permit, permits the pharmaceutical industry to target everyone in the country with billions of dollars of so-called legal drugs, while the military facilitates the dissemination of the drug cartels, illegal drugs from other countries, this time from Afghanistan via its phony war. Following World War II, the U.S. government, uh, the US government using its chief forces, plundered everything of value in the Axis countries, seizing at least 300,000 300, patents just from Germany. Corporate heads actually visited Germany as consultants on these seizures. After Tesla died, the government confiscated all of his work and distributed his revolutionary ideas along with all of those patents from Germany to its favorite corporations. Again, the corporation nation, as Clint Richardson calls it, works for and in behalf of corporate interests and will do anything imaginable all sorts of damage control in order to protect those corporations from all culpability and justice for the death and destruction that they continue to inflict throughout the world. Do you remember when water was relatively free and unadulterated from the faucet? Then a corporation introduced Avion bottled water. A friend of mine a few years ago noted the fact that Avion spelled backwards is naive. I wonder if there is something to that. Tesla believed that everyone should have access to safe energy without having to pay for it, just as everyone used to have access to water. Dr. Stanley Milham talks about the health issues that erupted through the metered corporate control of electricity. Now, corporate interests are attempting to attach a dangerous radiation-emitting smart meter to every home in America. All of this is an assault on every individual. All of these issues are relevant to today's guest, who is Dr. J. 
Judy Wood. And for uh, for uh, I, we would like you to visit drjudywood.com slash WTC for audio or for uh, visual images of what she might be talking about today. Her other website is wheredoestowersgo.com. Our other guest is Andrew Johnson. He is the author of 9-11, Finding the Truth. His website is Check the Evidence. Dr. Judy Wood wrote the book, Where Did the Towers Go? The Evidence of Directed Free Energy Technology on 9-11. Welcome, Dr. Wood and Andrew. Hello. Hi. Hi. (laughs) Thanks for having us here. Well, thank you so much. I haven't talked to Andrew for quite some time except uh, a few uh, Skype messages, text messages uh, from time to time. Uh, But anyway, I'm glad, very glad that you're both here. And may we just start out with me asking one question because somebody uh, somebody suggested this crazy idea to me about a week ago. Andrew, will you please confirm or deny whether or not you are Dr. Wood's handler? Uh, I will deny that I'm Dr. Wood's handler. <laughs> and I can speak from experience that uh, if, if such a person was given such a job, it would be unenviable. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Andrew learned early on. No, no one can tell uh, Judy what to do. <laughs> that, that's right, and and uh, I think that's absolutely right, and absolutely, uh, uh, you know, the way things should be. Absolutely. Be- you know, because it's it's very important that people understand that uh, the way that Doctor Wood thinks and uses her uh, mental and intellectual capacities is is the way they should be used, really, because they then, you know, can't really be influenced other than by what evidence is in front, you know, and being of her and being studied. If if you see what I'm trying to say, it, it you know, and that that it, because because the, she has that way of approaching things that has allowed every one of us to benefit from what she's discovered. Exactly. Uh, is, is what I'd like to sort of you know put in a nutshell, really. Sure. And it's amazing that somebody would suggest this. And I said, well, no, that that's ridiculous. Mm. Uh, but uh, anyway, I just wanted to get that on record. And um, so that, that's clarified, definitely. And I, I do agree with you. Uh, she does have a way of uh, looking at things that none of the rest of us really have. I, mm. uh, I'm just always amazed mm. that she can see things that... Uh, that um, well, I think I'm relatively intelligent, but she sees things that I I don't often see. So, yeah, and I would say exactly the, the same sort of thing. And uh, you know what I've tried to do in in our, um, you know, when I first got to know Doctor Wood and uh, and started writing these things, it was, I think I did it for, for two reasons. One was to set up a historical record, which I knew was going to be important to some people at least. Uh, even if that only ever turns out to be a small minority. <clears throat> but it was also a learning experience for me, which, you know, w- when I embarked upon it, upon it um, I, I realised that I was going to learn quite a lot of things, and indeed I have. So, you know, it, in, that, in that sense, it's almost for selfish reasons that, that uh, you know, uh, I've, I've done it. Sure. Uh, well, you have been one of her greatest supporters, and uh, for that, I, I applaud you. Uh, and that's uh, that's a wonderful thing to have that kind of um, consistent, uh, ongoing support. Uh, particularly given the the verbal assaults uh, that uh, Dr. Wood has experienced. Well, Andrew also has the ability to look at. You know, I say look look at this piece of evidence, and he'll look at the piece of evidence. Mm-hmm. You won't say, well, I've already been told thus and so, so I, I'm not going to uh, look. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that's that's the key is is actually looking at what is there, not what you're told to see or what you're told is there. Sure. And and I think also, you know, I would say that you know, Doctor Wood and I, Doctor Wood and I talked a lot about a lot of things, and sometimes, you know, I'm I'm only human, and I get a bit frustrated because I think, I think, well, Doctor Wood's told me this before. Why is she telling me this? Why is she telling me this? And then quite often I will realize that there is a subtlety she's trying to draw my attention to. 
you know, and I'm wanting to do something else or, you know, or something Thank like you. this. And, 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 and sometimes I get frustrated. Uh, but then at the end, at the end of it, you know, I can say, oh, right, that's what that's what she's trying to explain to me. And so I think that what that what I'm trying to say there is it does require a lot of patience and a lot of study, um, basically, uh, you know, to sort of, in a sense, catch up with with the place that she's gotten to. And you know, also to, to get to look beyond the superficial, because I think our culture trains people just look at the superficial mm. and then move on. And you think you have the whole picture by, you know, just getting a couple of tidbits and your your mind fills in the rest of what you assume based on those few tidbits. Uh, but but I remember, uh, it, it, and Andrew knows this story pretty well, uh, although you knew about John Hutchison's stuff already and I hadn't. Um, but mm-hmm. I was, I, you know, Andrew, why is that car parked upside down? Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was three times I said that. Then you, you broke out in curses and so forth. Oh, pretty, pretty much, yeah. I, I do remember that, and uh, I don't, I don't think I'd seen those pictures before, or certainly, uh, if I had, I, I obviously hadn't at that point connected them to these phenomena. So yeah, that, that's that's but one example, you know. So yeah. Sure. I think that was a big turning point for you, the, a big aha moment where, where oh, then yeah. you start seeing, you know, all the other details I've been pointing out just unlocked yeah. it. Okay. Now the the cars that were upside down. Uh, for those in the listening audience who do not know what you're referring to, uh, tell us what where we might find that uh, that picture. Um, on drwood.com slash WTC and what this phenomenon might might be or probably is. It's the only thing it could be, actually. Well, we, we aren't going to make assumptions as to what caused it, but what we can say is a building collapsed uh, with, without having much material left at the bottom isn't going to turn cars upside down. And without, you know, other things happening, like stripping uh, leaves from trees and you know, whatever else. If sure. there's such a huge gust of wind, why was all this paper sitting at the base? Ah, That's right. Indeed. That that was uh, that was quite amazing. And we've all been told, indoctrinated, and getting back to the to the uh, a comment that you made some time back, is that we were on that day on 9/11. We were all really. Uh, we we were traumatized by what was going on, and uh, it, it was the, the gen. You said the general population is suffering from trauma by based mind control. Nine eleven was an attack on human consciousness. How can one person find it so easy to destroy? Oh, okay. Well, I won't say that that comment, but because that that relates to something else. But it was an attack on human consciousness. Right. Oh, yeah, yes. And, uh, yeah, trauma-based mind control. That uh, it, it, There's an abrupt change, bigger change than I've ever seen any one day uh, on this, in my lifetime. Um, yeah, the JFK thing traumatized people, but it wasn't the same. This shut off people's ability to think. And I can never forget the discomfort I had in the faculty conference room, surrounded by my colleagues, also faculty in engineering, who taught the same or similar courses, watching the TV set and just assuming it's a collapse and, you know, the whole story. And I was trying to say, look, they're playing a joke on us. That isn't a collapse. The building's turning into fluff, you know. And they looked at me like I I was crazy, because they're sure. already, you know, sucked into it and like grabbing their pitchforks, ready to go get the bad guy, whoever that was. They're turned off their brains, and you know, this is it, these people just shut down their thinking. And also, that's what what anger does. It's one of the lowest forms of uh, instinct, animal instinct. And when you get in revenge mode, it shuts off logic function. Right. And that's an important thing to remember when people say, "Let's go get who done it, who done it." Well, you're doing the same thing. Doesn't matter if it's uh, you know Bin Laden, uh, Baghdad, or whatever. It's diverting you away from logical thinking. Sure. And uh, absolutely, I remember that day. I, well, we all remember that day. That uh, if we were old enough, and and certainly I'm 
old enough. But, but we all remember what we were doing. And they played the same scenes over and over. They kept saying the word collapse, collapse, collapse. And then, of collapse course, collapse and pile. Pile. And then Dan Rather also uh, brought up uh, controlled demolition. And that was, that was all programming to make us believe that uh, possibly controlled demolition has something to do with this alleged collapse of the World Trade Center. And you have, you have mentioned before that it wasn't a destruction of the World Trade Center, the two towers. It was a cleansing. Mm -hmm. uh, I I use the word dustification. But it was a cleaning away of something. I wrote something. I wrote wrote down that she said it was a cleansing. Uh, Oh. uh, No, no. I've listened to just about everything that you have you've said i've listened to all the conferences and <laughs> oh. yeah i i don't know if uh if i would have been uh um it it uh you know removed the the towers from being okay. there and without removing the adjacent buildings okay that, right. that's an important thing cause you you can't use controlled demolition to to uh take out a building with another building just a few feet away and not damage you know, not destroy the next building Sure. Especially when the building you're you're destroying, you know, is 110 stories. Right. I mean, it was uh, it was the, you know the, the the only buildings with the WTC prefix were destroyed on the, on outright, you know, or during the main events, and then were taken down afterwards. Except, of course, there was the Bankers Trust, which it was yeah. a bit of a, a bit of an enigma in some ways. Um, I mean, I would I would it was I would, it was infected. It was infected yeah. indeed. Not I, I don't. You know, my, well, we don't really know whether that was accidental to the plan or deliberate because, you know, we don't, I, I mean, I, I suspect looking at the way that part unfolded, it was probably accidental. But obviously, you know, uh, I don't really know. Also, the Millennium Hotel appeared to have been infected, but they took out the, the infected material and were able to, you know, control the situation. The right. initial pictures, it was fuming away, weird fuming coming out of there, but they removed um, the whole bunch of material. But they announced it, it was ready to collapse. And, you know, mm-hmm. they, that was in, in case they had to take it down. But they were able to repair it, and it was fine. So that, that's another instance of predictive programming, you know, saying that things are happening, are, are going to happen, you know, to make people, uh, you know, think about that subconsciously. And uh, you know the, there, are, there, are, there seems to be a number of aspects of that with 9/11. I mean, not only they'd started talking about Al Qaeda, and they mentioned Bin Laden's name. I think 45 seconds after the the alleged uh, the the first second one. plane. Yeah. yeah. No, that's uh, before the, before the second one. I've oh, got a, a, a screenshot thought, where it shows that it, Bin Laden and Al Qaeda, whatever, on the ticker going across the, the bottom of the screen. Right. Yeah. And the, sec- the, the second hour isn't fuming yet. Right. Wow. Right. Right. So yeah, and you know it's, uh, it's it's pretty pretty extraordinary type of operation, really. Nine Eleven. I think that's why, you know, certainly why I I I talk such a lot about it is because it was just on a different scale, a completely different scale, uh, and we we know that it didn't just happen. You know, we know that that Al Qaeda weren't involved in the level of destruction that you know was at the World Trade Center. So somebody else must have done it. Somebody else. Well, see, I, I, I won't go. I won't go to that statement. I, I'd say you have to de- define who Al Qaeda is. Right, of course. If, I mean, if, if, if Al Qaeda yeah, yeah. is the the name of the organization that did 9/11, okay, then Al Qaeda did it. But right. it's it, yeah, it's how you define what yes, Al Qaeda is. Of course, but what see, is there, commonly, there what is commonly under, exactly <laughs> what what is commonly understood by the you know Al Qaeda, which is alleged to be a group of uh, you know uh, terrorists who were based right. in in the Far East. It seems extremely unlikely that they would have right. been able to, uh, you know, uh, turn the towers into dust and so on. Uh, but we don't. Sure. Again, we don't actually know that they couldn't do that because we don't. A, no, we don't really know who they are. We know who we were told that they were, but uh, we don't actually know who, who they and, were. And a typical talking point that I, I hear is that well, some people say some, you know, somebody in a cave, you know, did this. Well, I suspect this technology was indeed developed in a cave. <laughs> yeah. For, for security purposes. Yeah. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, or underground somewhere. Sure. But you know, that, <laughs> sorry, the, the, those sorts of things we don't we don't actually know. Really, we can only speculate on where this mm-hmm. 
where this technology came from and we can only speculate on who it belongs to and uh, w w you know I, when people ask me this question I say well you know you, you, you can go and ask uh, there's two companies which you can probably go and ask if you wish to uh, and, and they may be able to tell you a bit more about uh, the events of 9-11 but they won't and that's Applied Research Associates and Science Applications International Corporation who are both uh, defence contractors and were both uh, defendants in, in Dr. Wood's Ketam case in, in 2007 and 2008. And they have the ability to uh, to direct energy, or do they have the ability? They have uh, let's, direct. Let's look at uh, you know where our tax dollars supposedly went. You know, it's, it's this thing called the Star Wars program, which was the, the massive development of some of various kinds of energy weapons. Okay. So maybe go ask the people there. They they, they might have a better idea. Right. Exactly I mean, exactly what the serial numbers are. You know, I mean, I mean, put, you know, if we could, if I would, I like to put it like this, really, essentially, in that we know that there are black black budget programs. You can actually go and you know, if you go to the right parts of the published defence spending and and add it all up, you can see that these huge gaps. And I think there was another story published another day uh, the other day about two point three or $10 trillion being unaccounted for in Pentagon accounts over the last 10 years or something. I, I, I don't know the exact figures in all of this. But the black budget is real, so there are huge sums of money which are on a balance sheet, but we don't know what they're spent on. So that money is going somewhere, and it appears that one of these benefactors uh, of the, of the black, so-called black budget uh, is Science Applications International Corporation. And one of the uh, uh, abilities is to run psychological operations. That's, I think, in their. I think you can find that on their website somewhere, can't you, Doctor Wood? I think is that correct? I think you. Yes. You yes, I have a web page that shows their capabilities. Um, when I was before I was filing my case, that I recorded stuff from their website. But one, one thing that I'd like to point out that uh, a lot of people overlook. It, it doesn't matter the who part of it. Again, that just draws you into re revenge mode and shuts off logical thinking. But let's let's look at what we do know. What we do know is that there is a technology that exists that can turn the buildings, the majority of the buildings, into dust in midair. We know that's true because it happened. Mm. You now that there's a technology that can do that. There's the proof right there. A lot of people say, well, you don't have proof. You need the serial numbers. No, we have the evidence mm. that that the buildings mostly turn to dust in midair. So, therefore, we know that a technology that can make that happen must exist. Right. But I think what what I was trying to point out was not so much who did it, but we, we can see kind of how the capability to develop the technology has you know has developed in secret if you and you know, I, I, i'm continually surprised by the lack of discussion of black budget programs they're very rarely discussed i mean one of the topics you'll find discussed on my website is you know the, the subject of uh, extraterrestrial life disclosure and ufos and that sort of thing and that is one of the few areas where you hear black budget programs being talked about but if you Let's just. I want one of the things I want to say. Let's take a company like SCIC, which is a big benefactor of the black budget. If that company has an interest in keeping its revenue stream going, and they have the ability as one of their, you know, alleged capabilities to protect the United States of America, to develop psychological operations, for example, to you know create propaganda or sophisticated uh, deception programs, then why shouldn't why wouldn't that that private company use that uh, you know that capability to protect its own revenue stream. In other words, it's in their own interests to use their own abilities to deceive people to keep the money flowing into that organisation. If you can see what I mean, uh, and I suspect that as you know, if you look at that as a total sort of area, that's that that allows them to keep what happened on 9/11 secret. That they're, they're they're assisting in that process in some way. <laughs> I hear the cat. <laughs> Uh, well, it wasn't my cat because my cat's just gone out. I managed to let her out without her uh, making too much noise. <laughs> no, I but, know, uh, I know that cat's voice. <laughs> <laughs> he has become something of a radio celebrity, I think. Yes, he has. <laughs> <laughs>
But yes, yeah, yeah, so, participate. Yeah, absolutely. I think he knows as well. The, this, this particular uh, feline is is quite prescient and uh, no, knows when these conversations are taking place. <laughs> I think so. Too. so uh, <laughs> but, oh yeah. goodness! Uh, now this this uh, you were talking about black operations, and I I think that the general public really does not even think of black operations. They right. know that that the government. Uh, the, is corrupt. They they know they can't trust the government, and yet they don't they don't really allow their mind to go so far as to think black operations, and that they're actually conducted against the general public, and that they have they have technology, as I as I kind of implied in in my opening remarks, they have technology that we can't even imagine. Correct. Correct. <clears throat> And you know, I, recently I got in touch with somebody. Uh, he's called Edgar Fouché, and he, uh, I did a long discussion with him, which I all put onto YouTube, which I won't go into the details here. But he basically worked as a defence contractor, and he worked on black programs. You know, he, he, there are still things which he can't talk about, 25, 30 years uh, after he worked on them. There are some things that he can talk about, uh, and so he he knows firsthand. For, you know some of the technology that the NSA has, for example, but he, a lot of what he knows about is, is, is 20 years old, and uh, you know he, he wrote a fictional book in which he, he uh, disclosed a lot of this technology, um, and uh, b but you know even even he uh, through my own conversations with him he didn't know uh, you know about the, the he didn't know the full picture of what happened on 9/11. Uh, because he he hadn't really studied it to the depth that uh, Dr. Woodhouse and, and I have, and mm -hmm. I think um, you know that again without going into the details. Once I once once I sort of uh, started to explain a bit to him, he could begin to tie it up with a little bit of what he knew, and and, and the way that we came into contact was partly to do with 9/11 research actually, um, and I I've I've come to the conclusion. Uh, and I've written a bit of this in, you know, 9-11 Finding the Truth, that the black programs and the technology that was turned into a weapon is also, you know, there is a um, there is a history to it, I and mean, Dr. Woods put some of that in her book, but the bit that, that, that other people don't talk about is, is the weaponization of it. People talk about, you know, the Tesla technology and the free energy technology, but they do, they do not talk. I mean, if you go, you know, we experienced this when we went to this uh, this uh, breakthrough energy movement conference in in November 2012, and we were we were both speaking about the weaponization of this technology. Nobody else uh, really seemed didn't seem to almost, almost didn't seem to register with anybody else. You know, they just didn't didn't even go into their uh, uh, you know they didn't mention it in their talks or sure. anything subsequently because it does not fit with their what they want to talk about basically or what they can conceive of and Almost, I, yeah. I think that um, well we know that by 2025 that the government hopes to weaponize weather and if they have the technology to weaponize weather which I'm sure that they've already put into practice if they have that technology then why not the technology to to direct energy towards yes. destruction. Yes. Well, it, yeah. it, it, directed energy has been around for, for well over a hundred years. There's a patent on it uh, in the early 1900s. George that, Pigott. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. So you know, so we know that you know that we know that they used the technology on 9/11, and. Uh, uh, and you know, I just look at and think, well, what other technology have they got? You know, and you look at some of the technology that Wilhelm Reich developed, for example, where he was, uh, you know, looking at uh, controlling cloud formation with the cloud busters, and that was in the fifties. Right. And, and 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 hardly anyone talks about that. Uh, some people do, but it's, it's it, you know, not many people mention it. And I I have to wonder myself wh where that technology went because. I think he was the only scientist, if I've got this right, in, in the U.S. Whose, whose books were burned. You know, and they took out all mention of the word really? orgone energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Burned books in America? 
Yeah. Surely yeah. it should. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, when you think about it, <clears throat> excuse me, when you really think about it, uh, isn't the, the energy that we receive into our homes each and every day, isn't that directed uh, through some, well, through wires and, and other mechanisms? Um, I mean, this is directed energy. Would With it not be? Cell phones, yes. TV remote control, uh, television, television signal, uh, you know, radio signals. It's all directed energy. Absolutely. But I think one of, one of the things which I always try and try and explain to people is that in main, you know we have mainstream science we have mainstream physics and uh, w you know everyone's trained in mainstream physics I mean part of my degree was in physics and so there's this certain model you know about how the atom works and how uh, forces work you know the electromagnetic force and uh, the strong and, nu strong and weak nuclear forces and gravitational force you know and you have these um, four fundamental forces which are meant to be you know you can explain physics in terms all the physics we know can be explained in terms of those forces but there are a number of other phenomena which you can uh, you know you can reproduce uh, and people can watch a video for example of uh, a chap called Eric Laithwaite who's a British physicist and he did a an interesting set of lectures in 1974 or was actually one particular one hour long lecture which I've got on my website with gyroscopes and he was just simply, all he had was just you know, regular gyroscopes and he'd set them up in particular ways. And he was showing that these gyroscopes physically did not behave according to the laws, you know, of gravitation in, in certain circumstances. You can simply you can watch this video and it's just, it's not tricky or anything. This guy was a member of the Royal Society, which is the oldest scientific society in the world. So what I'm trying to say is that... Uh, there is a, a hidden physics, if you will, a black physics, and clearly somebody knows how that physics works because they they have a sufficient knowledge of it to to use it to engineer things, and they engineer use it to engineer the destruction of the World Trade Center. In other words, it's a different type of physics that's at work. It's a I, I've got an example of it that that anyone could uh, recognize: uh, tornadoes. Mm. You know, where where does that energy come from? That it can totally dustify a house, or, or you know, remove just the roof and leave everything else, including the stack of papers, untouched. Wind does not act like that. And if you if you could, uh, you know, that's a natural example. If you could actually manufacture that same type of energy field, you could do the same thing. Right. You know, dustify a house. You know, make a like a like a tornado. Sure. <clears throat> And the the elite, as I see them, um, have always tried <coughs> excuse me tried to control uh, all sciences. Uh, when you're mm. talking about the Royal Society and absolutely, and all, they have always always controlled and uh, concealed science uh, yeah. from the rest of us. Uh, absolutely, and I think you know the way that that is done. You know, is is that you create a structure like, for example, the peer review process. Whenever you publish scientific research, you know, if I wanted to publish scientific research myself, you know, I just have a, a degree in computer science and physics, and if I was to write an academic paper and try and submit it, it probably wouldn't be accepted because I haven't got any advanced degrees. So, in other words, if I want to get you know my, my research peer reviewed. I've got to jump through the hoops to get an advanced degree. And I'm not necessarily saying that's a bad thing, but it's you've got you know you've got to go through that process and go through the right doors. And then even if you've done all of that, if you've got enough people within the peer review process who have, let's shall we say, um, split loyalties, or pay eight hundred, or pay eight hundred bucks. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You, or or yeah, you, 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 you can, can do that. You can do you know and get it published in a vanity journal, I suppose. But you know that that, that that's another another method. But uh, then uh, people would know that that uh, is a vanity journal, and it wouldn't really be valued in the same way as you know uh, a letter to, to in, published in the Journal of the American Physical Society or, or something like sure. that. So so as you say, because all those structures are all set up, and you have to you know go through all the hoops to to get. Um, recognized by them or get published by them, then that that 
acts as a control mechanism. Similarly with the patent office, you know, if you want to protect your intellectual property, then you, you know, you have to get a patent. So if you have uh, enough people, or even one or two people within the patent office who are reviewing those patents, you can control what happens to those patents. Um, uh, and so yes. On. Yes. So, uh, so, so if you get somebody who tries to patent a free energy device or, or something that could be some type of weaponry or be developed into a weapon, then you can you can put that under national security. Um, I did an article uh, probably back in '06 about a gentleman, uh, George Horvat, mm -hmm. and uh, he he wa he had a patent, or he wanted to uh, to uh, get a patent on a certain thing. Uh, they they prolonged the process for about ten years. I'm trying to find it right now. It's called the fleecing of a, of an American. Mm -hmm. And what they the patent was for uh, the overhead the overhead GPS uh, apparatus that we have on many of the of the country's roads where uh, they can track you. Right. Uh, at, and he actually, George Horvat, his name is H-O-R-V-A-T, uh, what he called his system was the Traffic Speed Surveillance System. And it included a roadway monitor receivers that would, receive, that would uh, record speed and vehicle identification and driver information, and it would be transmitted to a central processing station for identifying the speed limit violators. Now, he, didn't, he did not create this. Uh, it, for for the purposes that it is now being used for, but what they did is that they literally prolonged the the process for the patent. Uh, that they actually stole it from him and uh, sold it to uh, well the government. Uh, the government took over the patent. And even though Horvat hired an attorney and went after these people, and this was, he did this back in the 80s, and um, they, he initiated a, a, a search at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, and um, anyway, they, it they, they, me of, they, took uh, him, they took him to the cleaners. Yeah, it reminds me of, of what uh, they do in what I call collection agencies. They mm -hmm. collect people who have uh, would-be products. Oh, we'll help fund you and get it started. And so you go there, you show them all your designs, and then your designs kind of get killed somehow. Exactly. And, I mean, this, this is really insidious as well. I think you know, what I'd like to mention at this point is, you know, one of the key factors, and this has come up again very recently, uh, you know, when we talk about the connection between the events of 9/11 and, and the, the energy phenomenon, which has become known as cold fusion, and I, I don't, again, I don't really want to go into the details of that, but and we've all, but we've already mentioned this, and it's the connection between the events of 9/11 and energy. We've already talked about directed energy, and, and Dr. Woods discussed that at some length before, and it's in her book. And again, it's one of those things that nobody can really kind of grasp straight away, the connection between 9-11 and energy. And I'm not talking about, you know, how much oil there is in the, in, the, in the Middle East and in Saudi Arabia and all that type of energy situation. This is energy that's been used as a weapon and right. used to destroy the World Trade Center. And we, we've, we've seen that there is this connection. So, you know, it's not really totally clear what it is or why it is, but we can see, for example, that Stephen E. Jones, the physicist from Brigham Young University, he used to do research in the field of cold fusion. He was working on that in the mid-80s. And then he was instrumental in this kind of cover-up stroke, muddle-up campaign of the early 90s, which ended up with Pons and Fleischmann, you know, uh, the, the research chemists who discovered or rediscovered this uh, phenomenon of uh, low-energy nuclear reactions. He was involved with all of that. And then Stephen E. Jones appears in 2005 in the scene of 9-11 research, and I was taken in by him, as I've written him at quite some length. But it wasn't until about a year later that I found out that he was actually involved in cold fusion. And, and, and one of the important factors appears to be this uh, thing called tritium, which was found in anomalous quantities in the water 
near the, the destruction of the World Trade Center around that time in a, in a, in a scientific sampling that was done there. Uh, and um, it was also found in these Pons and Fleischmann experiments, and it sh in neither case it shouldn't have been there, or at least not in the quantities that they found it in. And we, we also, the, also the rising dust, you know, su suspicion of uh, helium or something like that in the process. Uh, right, yeah, and yeah. So there could have been the formation of helium, which is also potentially one of the things uh, which which may have happened in small quantities in these uh, experiments. So what I'm saying is that we're, we're I would say that we're like starting to get a bit of a glimpse into this other physics, this other science, which clearly somebody we don't know who it is knows how to engineer. So. It's very important that people, we know that it's very important that people uh, get an understanding of this because I experienced very recently, and I don't know whether Dr. Wood and yourself discussed this, somebody was writing to me about uh, my book, 9-11 Finding the Truth, in which I document essentially how I came into contact with Dr. Wood. And, you know, I, 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 we, this scholars group was set up, the 9-11 scholars group was set up, and then it broke up. And then we had the, the, Jim Fetzer, he had one group, and Steve Jones had this other group. And then we had the architects and engineers group set up and such. And I, I've written about that at quite, quite some length, you know, I almost ad nauseam. And uh, just a, uh, about a month ago, I think it was now, I had a, a lady called Caroline Louise wrote to me uh, claiming that she was interested in the you know what happened with the scholars group and what happened with the 9/11 truth movement and blah 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 and uh she said she wanted to get both sides of the story and uh and I thought well what sides you know because I've actually yeah, put, the truth doesn't have sides yeah I've actually put <laughs> true. you know or, or anyway even, 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 even yeah exactly and she was going on and on and on about this but I thought well so what all the stuff that I've written is all there for you to take a look look at and, if and you your have book any... is free for download. Yeah. It's not like you have to go out and purchase it. Exactly, exactly. And it's an audio book. So she could just read that, and then if she had any questions, she can ask me those specific questions. But the point I was trying to get to was, she said she was writing about the scholars group, right? But then subsequent emails that I received were asking about Steve Jones. And she specifically asked me about three articles which weren't in the book, and were not written by me, and were about Stephen E. Jones. So I could clearly see that she was somehow, for some reason, concerned about the information that I had on my website about Stephen E. Jones, which, of course, goes right back to this energy connection. That's what she was concerned about. And I've written all this up in an article, um, which people can read. It's on the recent postings side of my website. But it, what I wanted to point out was a couple of things. That just shows you how important this energy connection is because the number of people that are looking at this in the way that I'm describing and understanding it is very small. It's very, very small. You know, you look at all the 9-11 research websites and all the 9-11 stuff that's published and you'll probably find perhaps four or five websites in the whole wide world which are discussing the cold fusion issue in connection to the 9-11 mission. We, we could, Dr. Wood and I, if we sat down right now, we could probably name all of the people who have written those articles, and it's probably going to be less than 10 people in the whole world. Sure. Here's, here's a, uh, a challenge for the listener. If you have a website, put one, post one of these articles on your website, and then see how quickly you'll get an email telling you that you're discrediting yourself and you better take it down. Sure. Yeah. That, that, that happens pretty quickly. Sure, and this lady that uh, that was basically on a uh, a fishing expedition to your to you, Andrew, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, to figure out what you uh, where your what your stance was, even though it was quite obvious in your book what your stance was. Right. And and when Dr. Wood was at a conference, and I can't remember which conference this was, you showed a a photo. Or a video, actually it was a video of a meeting where Dr. Stephen Jones attended. He was on the on the podium there uh, with five or six other gentlemen. They were voting, if we can say voting on the truth. They were trying to decide about about Fleischmann, about cold fusion. Uh, could you just elaborate on that, Dr. Wood? 
Yes, it's uh, this segment from 1989. I forget the exact date. Andrew probably knows it, March or April 1989, yeah. where uh, uh, Stephen Jones uh, held this vote, vote for science. Let's see if we can vote against, you know, totally, uh, Fleischmann's totally bogus. We can ignore him, right, right? And everybody puts their hand up. Stephen Jones initially puts his hand up, and then people, without even thinking, just their hand goes up. Okay, cold fusion's dead. Let's move on. We yeah, I mean, what that, what that vote, I think, was on was Jones was encouraging the other scientists to vote where the Pons and Fleischmann had actually, dis- actually, um, you know, discovered actually, anything relative, worthwhile. Well, important. Well, it was, mm-hmm. well, it was, it, it, into. It was mm-hmm. specifically, it gets a little bit technical, but it was specifically where the Pons and Fleischmann had discovered a different way of doing what's called deuterium deuterium fusion, which is, um, you know, a, a doorway to, to make it, to get in energy, right? So they were voting on whether this particular effect had taken place in Pons and Fleischmann's experiment. That was apparently what this, this vote was about, according to Jones. But the, the thing was that I, th- I think there's only, probably only one or two of this group of scientists has actually done their own experiments to try and reproduce it, which they could have done. And if they wanted to actually verify what Pons and Fleischmann had done, they could have got the kit together, and it wasn't particularly unique you could you could probably get it for a couple of thousand dollars and they would have had that in their research budgets if they chose to to to, to but do at that. that time Pons and Fleischmann had just you know rolled it out and they're kind of pressured uh, yeah. into rolling yeah. it out and then and, and then, so no others hadn't had the opportunity to try it yet right sure. and then and then also about a year after Pons and Fleischmann actually you know suggested it might be fusion they ended up withdrawing that claim because they'd done further experiments which showed that it couldn't actually be fusion. It was some other nuclear effect that was going on, but they didn't really understand what it was. And I think even now they don't understand what it is. But it, but it is real. It's a real effect. And Jones has claimed subsequently that I and uh, Doctor would have attacked him because we've actually d- just been describing that to the public. You know, just that description you've given you right there. We've been putting that information out to the public to illustrate, as I said earlier, that Jones was involved in cold fusion and he was involved in cold fusion research and he and was he, involved he in 9-11 research. And he coined the term cold fusion. Yeah, exactly. And, he, and, 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 and that, he, we've, I've got an audio of him, audio of him saying that. And, it, and with all my articles on my website, the same is true of that one. I just put down what people have actually said and I point out that it seems to be relevant you know, to this or that or the other thing, and I show the evidence for that. And I sure. haven't, you know, I haven't said, well, Jones is obviously, you know, uh, sabotaging cold fusion. I've got an article by somebody else on my website who said that, but I've never accused Jones of sabotaging cold fusion as such. I've, I've said that he kept the phenomenon covered up, and I think what he did was wrong. Um, but I don't, I don't, I don't think I've said anything other than that. Yet he gets away. With uh, you know uh, uh, accusing, <laughs> yeah, you know, and he goes round saying that Doctor Wood's uh, research is about space beams, and that would be like me going around or us going around and say, oh yeah, that that Stephen E. Jones, he said that the World Trade Center was blown up with dynamite, you know, and he doesn't or, say or that. Or it was blown up with fairy dust. <laughs> yeah, or it was blown up with, fairy, and he doesn't sure. say that. He says thermite, but we can report accurately what he said. In other words, that he has this idea that thermite was used. I mean, it's clearly ridiculous when you look at it. But at least we report accurately what he says, uh, sure. and we don't we don't say, oh yeah, he says dynamite or you know whatever. So well, that's... it's really obvious in the video when you see the video which you showed Dr. Wood at this conference that uh, he he put his hand up, then he looked to his left and look to his right as if to say, well, come Good. on, guys, yeah. get your hands up. It's very obvious that there was some intimidation, uh, silent intimidation, uh, to vote with uh, Dr. Jones. Yeah. Uh, and, and people uh, tend to go with the flow without thinking, and I think that's why I felt compelled to show it there, because this is the, it was at the meeting on you know, New Energy. And you know, let's not let this happen again. Let's think before we vote. Sure. That, that was what I was really trying to emphasize, and I ended my presentation with saying, you know, we don't need history to repeat. No, we let's don't. learn from it. Let's let's learn from it, and not just, you know, because that held it off for for, uh, you know, well, still it has a, a bad rap, even though there was a 60 minutes presentation by uh, Scott Pelley, where he actually interviewed Fleischman, and he says, "Do you have oh, any I regrets?" 
Mm-hmm. He says, uh, yeah, letting my competitor call it cold fusion. Ah, that, yes. that, that, that's what Fleischman is quoted as saying, which contradicts pretty much what Jones has said. And I, I know who I believe on that one, you know. Sure. Um, and, of course, Fleischman has passed on now. He he passed on, I think, uh, last last year, just I think about 18 months ago, um, or 20, yeah. late, late 2012. I forget the exact date. I think it was last early. In August, um, I think. Was sure. it right? Yeah. So, so he, you know, he, he's no longer with us. And uh, sadly, another uh, cold fusion researcher of great... Uh, 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 the great, uh, you know, record was uh, John Bockris, who also uh, he took July forward. 7th. Yeah, yeah, he he took forward the cold fusion research at, and he was investigated by the university for doing so for eleven months. He's the one who who discovered tritium. Yeah, he he reproduced the tritium, and then he also reproduced this other uh, important effect, which is called transmutation, which is where you get um, new metal. You know, new, new elemental metal forming within the the cell. You know, so you get copper coming in where then the, where there was only palladium before, and uh, of course they couldn't tell anyone about that because that was al- alchemy. You know, and uh, they were accused of all kinds of nonsense because of that. But that's what they found in their experiment, and so did other people. And and it, it appears that this effect is also important in some of the physical evidence at the World Trade Center. This. Uh, possible transmutation of elements and 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 and, and uh, ongoing effects and so on. Sure. Um, we we did have a couple questions in the chat room. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe we could uh, get uh, get a. I'll, I'll ask them. Um, uh, bombs were reported going off before the first plane hit and before the first building was brought down. Oh, yeah. Or brought, I don't like to say hang, hang, down, hang on, the bombs weren't reported, the sound of explosions were okay. reported. Okay. <laughs> if somebody saw a bomb in front of them, they would have been blown up. See how you see, are. See, just see, somebody hears the sound of it doesn't equal what they've imagined caused it. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> that's a question that comes up a lot, actually. Sure. And, um, you know, so it's, 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 it's a valid question. And uh, I think the first thing, as Dr. Wood pointed out, you know, we've said this before, that um, thing, you know, not everything that goes boom is a bomb. You know, uh, sure. if you put an egg in a microwave, I think it's the analogy that uh, we've used before, and you switch the microwave on, you'll hear a boom, but you didn't put, a, you know, a bomb in there. And to 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 to, to get to possible explanations for the uh, explosive sound. Um, one of the things which is reported and is not commonly known of is the exploding oxygen tanks on the so-called Scott packs, which were actually on the back of the fire trucks, away from the towers, a few yards distant. These things were exploding spontaneously on really? the backs of the mm-hmm. trucks. Yep, and, yep. and some were in uh, ambulances too, at ground level. So, so what what would have caused that? Well. If we, if you, again you study the evidence that's in Dr. Wood's book and on the website and in the videos, whichever you feel free to study, you will see that um, the Hutchinson effect has the effect of weakening metal or, or making it fracture or turn to jelly even. So if you imagine this, this metal weakening, well, what's going to happen with metal weakening or fracturing on a pressurized tank? Well, guess what? It's going to explode, isn't it, when you've got high pressure inside. It's like a balloon sitting on a puddle of acid. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, so that that you know, and, and think of all the fire extinguishers that were in the tower. They probably had five hundred or a thousand or two thousand fire extinguishers in those buildings. Think of a few of those going off, or even one going off, uh, you know, and exploding because the tank had weakened and the pressure was getting out. So, there's, so I would contend. Uh, you know, we ha- I don't. I don't know if we've got. Unless Doctor was going to correct me. I don't know if we've got any. Um, witness accounts from inside the towers of saying, oh, you know, uh, exploding mm-hmm. Scott packs. But if the, no. if there was a fire truck parked at the side and one of these Scott packs goes off and somebody's round the other side of the tower, they might think the explosion has come from inside the tower, you know, when it's actually okay. from a fire truck around, around the corner. There's nothing inside identified as as exploding that I'm aware of, but there was identify, identification of the building turning to dust internally before it, mm. its final demise by somebody who uh, was able to get out by the skin of their teeth. Right. Now, <clears throat> there's also um, some indication, uh, according to someone in the chat room, uh, that all of the glass 
in the lobby was blown out. And um, mm. and they said that this is shown on the video, and I asked what video and who created the video. Uh, the, the glass was shattered in the, the lobby from what I've seen, uh, some of it, not all of it, but some of it. And also witnesses who were evacuating, you know, civilians, uh, described the marble on the side of the staircase entering the lobby was, was crumbling off the walls. Yes. But we also know that on the the face of the WFC buildings, that's the, that's the World Financial Center buildings across the street, uh, all the marbles aside went missing. I mean, it just crumbled off, apparently. Amazing. So it's material specific. <clears throat> and the vehicles, of course, uh, the window glass uh, crumbled off, off of those. And uh, we don't see any trace of, of the toilets or urinals or anything, out of what should be about 3,000. Absolutely. And, and people can see this, uh, the things that you're talking about. In fact, if you will go to, or if you will visit uh, drjudywood.com slash WTC and just scroll down just a bit, uh, pa um, past the, um, past A, destruction of WTC1, uh, you will see a list of, you'll see first shortcuts and index. And in B, you will see some of the principal data that must be explained. And there is a 41 numbers, 41 sentences, 41 issues uh, that she addresses. And, um, I mean, it's, it's just very interesting. <laughs> One of the things that, that people have accused you of, and I just, I just think it's amazing. She has no evidence. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, yeah. But one of the things that, that you have said is, do you think those who planned 9-11 forgot to plan a cover-up? And do you think that those in charge of the cover-up would allow a large organization to pursue what happened unobstructed if they were on the right track? And you are being accused of of destroying the truth movement. And it's, it's so crazy because... Little, little old me, one person... One person, and uh, you are the object of, well, you've done a lot of research, but yet you're the object of questionable, intense criticism from the very people who should be anxious, anxious to see what you've done. And what well-organized agency is behind such venom? Certainly it's not spontaneous. I, I mean, right. thousands of people throughout the Internet aren't all of a sudden going to spontaneously attack you they, they, they no one has refuted anything i've presented they've put out false propaganda and refuted their own false propaganda like space beams i don't present oh, exactly. space beams so you know so what they're refuting is what stephen jones and others have stated i said but it's not right. what i said and so if, if you start you know well well so and so said uh you know, I, I could say Stephen Jones said it was fairy dust and then go refute fairy dust. But I don't do that. And as Andrew pointed out when I made that comment, he said, yeah, people who are interested in the truth don't do things like that. Certainly. Yeah. I mean, Absolutely, uh, uh, of course. You've been accused of of assuming other pe people's name on the Internet and then doing all kinds of weird things. I mean, people are making all sorts of accusations. They're not addressing what you have what exactly. stated. They right. are just uh, creating issues that are totally irrelevant without addressing what you have stated as evidence, empirical right. evidence. I mean, I'd like to make a couple of points as well on that, because again, if you know, if you read, if people were to read the book that I've put together, uh, which you can get from, uh, if you go to tinyurl.com forward slash 911 digits that is FTB you can get you can download that from that page for your Kindle or your iPad or whatever and it's an audio book as well that somebody essentially did for me um, but I, I you know people can think that that's about so-called infighting that's what it might look like and it's unfortunate that if you if somebody is trying to cover up what you know is true or mischaracterize it you have a choice. You can either sit back and do nothing or you can actually point out what they're up to. And some people think it's divisive when you're trying to focus on 
what these people are doing and possibly what their motives might be. But I, you know, I took that decision to do it and I've continued to do it. And people have, some people, a few people have written to me and said, yeah, I get it now. I understand it. And I think that takes you back to the planning cover up. The cover up, it's, it's huge. It's enormous. It's, it's just mind boggling. And I, and I say to people, you know, what I'm going to tell you, if, 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 I, if I was to sit down with you and talk about what I found out regarding 9-11 and Dr. Wood's research in the last, uh, you know, um, really six to ten years, um, you would, even a conspiracy theorist would not believe it. You know, that, that's what I tell people. And, and I myself, you know, I, I, I got to know this chap in 2006 called Ian Henshaw, and I took him to be an honest guy, you know, and he was trying to find the truth about 9-11, he runs a website called reinvestigate911.org. You will not find one link, not one reference to Dr. Wood's book or her court case or anything like that or my website. And uh, I've had a few email exchanges with him over the last few years. And he wrote to me last year, 2012 actually, late 2012, and he said, um, just in case you don't realise, this is Ian Henshaw writing to me, and this is a direct quote, you were personally the biggest single cause of the collapse of the 9-11 Truth Campaign in the UK. <laughs> That's what he wrote in email to me. You're so <laughs> powerful, Andrew. Oh, Just like okay. people say, I broke up the scholars group. I, That's few ridiculous. people realize yeah. Morgan Reynolds and I resigned in August, uh, August 17th, 2006. Mm-hmm. The uh, divorce between Fetzer and Jones was in December. Right, it was. I remember. And, totally. and it was Morgan and I started posting actual evidence. And into October and so forth, and I, I presented uh, my work, some of my work at the National Press Club in early September, thanks to Morgan. Morgan has done the most for me. And, and while I was there, there was someone who met me who got me on Ambrose Lane's radio show. And Ambrose Lane has done more for getting my information out there than anyone. And, you know, then putting up the website and so forth, it was starting to gain momentum. And, and to distract away from it, it appears that, that uh, they had this divorce, you know, a big spit fight, and people looked at the spit fight instead of the evidence I was yes. presenting. Well, I note, I was a member. I was a, a lesser member of that group. And, uh, and, of course, everybody had to be vetted to be in the group. But the, the forum was very, very uh, well monitored. You could, I, could, I never got to post anything on the forum because well it was monitored uh moderated to the point that what was the point of trying to post anything mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that was my my views of it right uh, dr wood how many times have you appeared on any of the fox news or any of the other uh mainstream media television programs zero <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, look what happened to Jesse Ventura for having me on his show, or trying to have me on his show. Hmm, where is he now? Yeah, his show was canceled. Not only that, the uh, his show on 9-11 that he had me on for got turned into this total nonsense thing. Sure. But, but they didn't uh, put words in my mouth that weren't there, which was, thankfully, well, he just chopped good. it down to, to nothing. So it was, he was very respectful of me. Sure. Uh, somebody, um, I was watching, well, I rewatched a, a video over the weekend. Um, in fact, this person actually incorporated some of your diagrams into her video. She did mention your name, which was, well, I was, it was good of her to do that. I don't think she probably uh, got permission to use your stuff. Uh, but I was watching it, and... Um, in the video, it showed the angle cut column, and hmm. and then um, then you have asked previously, uh, which column do you cut that causes the building to turn to powder in mid air? <laughs> yeah, you look at the picture on the cover of my book and they get out your hacksaw. Which which you know column are you going to cut? What does that have to do with what happened to buildings? And this is something you know. There's people with an opinion and an internet connection who believe that makes them an expert. And there's, there's this uh, this new trend towards just having an opinion. You don't need to even go to elementary school. You can just declare yourself an expert and, and 
sure. look at whatever website you do on the internet and, and reproduce it over and over again without understanding what you're doing. But the the thing about being an expert in forensic science and forensic engineering is knowing how to approach a problem. To first look at the evidence. What does the evidence tell us tell you? Sure. And you don't start out with, you know, how it was done. How it was done before you define what it is. And so you you have this cut column, you need but you need to have a connection between that cut cut column and what happened to the building. Sure. The same with a dust baggie. You know, how does that dust baggie explain what happened to the building? The building turned ma- mainly into dust and midair. Well, of course, then your dust bag is going to contain all the constituents of what was in Sure. Uh, the thing that is so compelling to me is the seismic graphs and the fact that if it had collapsed, if buildings had collapsed as they imply as they suggest repeatedly, there would have been uh, horrible damage done to the bathtub, and that just was not the case at all. Yeah, the bathtub was a dike that held out the Hudson River. It was built around the towers because the towers were on bedrock that was 70, that's 7 times 10, 70 feet below the water table. And the bathtub was not ruptured with the uh, supposed demise and, and with bombs, explosives, and material crashing down, you know, that that uh, pretty much uh, rules out any kind of kinetic energy being involved. Such, such as a bomb, yes. Um, the other thing, too, uh, that uh, just struck me is the fact that just using logic and common sense, if the these 19... Not so Arabs, common, but... <laughs> <laughs> If 19 Arabs with box cutters uh, actually perpetrated this this event, and uh, wouldn't they want to make as much damage as possible? And if they did, in fact, use uh, bombs or, or whatever, or planes or, or w- w- missiles or whatever, wouldn't they have wanted to rupture the bathtub and ma- and flood the entire uh you know, the paths, trainways, and the subway, and all that stuff. Well, if you, if you want maximum damage, yeah, tip, tip you the buildings a, over, and you take out all southern Manhattan, including exactly, flooding it. Exactly. So it wasn't damage that they were after. It was something something else. Yeah, Who knows right. what else? Right. I, I'd like to read a quote by um, Michael Ober, an EMT. He says, I don't remember the sound of a building hitting the ground. Someone told me that it was measured on the Richter scale... I don't know how true that is. If the building's hitting the ground that hard, how do I not remember the sound of it? I mean, he was right there. <laughs> ah, yes. And I think that some of the videos that people made, they actually added explosion sounds just mm-hmm. to be deceptive and to, and to promote that idea that it was a collapse. Yeah, I think there was, def- there was definitely one video where I saw... And I was sure that that had, a, had a, cause it was a really loud explosive sound on it, and just the way it was put in, it, I think it was one of these that was meant to be just near building number seven. That was a good few years ago that I saw that video, and I, I was immediately suspicious of it. Mm-hmm. But what, one of the things I'd just like to mention about truth truth movements as well, the, or the truth movement, whatever that is, you know, and we we've both been accused of uh, uh, you know d- dividing the truth movement or damaging it or whatever whatever it is well let's just consider uh, 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 that 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 expression truth movement so <laughs> where, where exactly would you, what, where where exactly would people like the truth to be moved to exactly you know over into this little corner where nobody can see it which is essentially uh, you know what 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 they've tried to do because and they 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 they've established this truth movement to move the truth out of view that's what the truth movement has done, certainly in relation to the events of uh, uh, the World Trade Center on 9/11. Uh, sure. That, that's what's happened. So truth, truth, truth doesn't really need a movement. The truth needs to be spoken of. It doesn't actually need a movement. You need to be looking at the evidence to establish what the truth is. And the moment that you start to move away from that process, is that's when you start to, uh, you know, help the truth to be covered up. Sure. Uh, speaking of evidence, uh, somebody in the chat room said, the funniest thing about the guests 
argument is that they want us to believe something that is contrary to the evidence. All of the evidence, visual, audible, chemical, mathematical, eyewitness, and dozens of pieces of circumstantial evidence. I'm not sure. Uh, are these two just using the 9-11 incident to air their own personal interest in alternative energy, or do they actually have some tangible evidence? Well, apparently they haven't looked at uh, my website or my book or listened to my presentations. Exactly. Which can be found on my website, drjudywood.com. That's D-R-J-U-D-Y-W-O-D dot com. If you go um, there, the first thing you see is a video. Watch that video and you see evidence. Well, I mean, what people like that could do if they want is they could, uh, you know, click on the video and then they could stick their fingers in their ears and put their hands over their eyes and then say, oh, I can't see any evidence here. Or they could buy the book la, 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 la. and then not read it sure. or not take responsibility for reading it. I mean, even uh, this Jim Fetzer character, he actually admitted on his Amazon review he hadn't actually read the book. So if but you're not actually going to look at the evidence, yeah. then you know you can declare that there is none because you haven't actually it hasn't actually come into your awareness. Sure. So so the only way that whoever made that statement can be making it legitimately is that. Uh, they have not actually looked. Now, however, if they have some problem with understanding the evidence and they don't see the connections that we've spoken of or have reason to disbelieve what we've actually been presenting with, you know, to them now or you know, since uh, to pick a date, 2006, 2008, if they have reason to disbelieve those presentations, then say what that reason is rather than just accusing us of not actually presenting any evidence. Sure. Uh, this and person that, also said, let, let me just uh, yes, give you this one more comment, uh, the, uh, and I quote, the whole 9-11 truth movement started when people realized that they were looking at a controlled demolition <laughs> and not a pancake collapse, but they were told what they were looking at yeah. on that date, 9-11. They were well, in the, the so-called truth movement, they were also told, this is what sure. you shall say. Here are the talking points. And they're issued talking points that they repeat over and over again, like steel-toed boots melting, uh, you know, and, and all the steel shipped to China. They're given all these talking points that they are to memorize. And, it, you know, in my book, I don't tell people what to believe. I, here, I've just collected the evidence for them to look and through and figure out for themselves. There's a couple of points I'd like to make in, in response to that as well. I, firstly, I was taken in by the controlled demolition ideas and hypothesis and, and alleged evidence. I was taken in by that, and I've written about that. And um, so people can, can go and read about that if they wish. And, uh, you know, again, it comes back to this idea of truth. I think one of the tr one of the rules for speaking about you know what happened on 9/11 and telling people what you know is you shouldn't say anything that is knowingly untrue, all right? And if you you accidentally say something which is untrue and you, somebody you know then corrects you on that, you should take that correction forwards and use that corrected information the next time you speak about it. So, for example, um, when Steve Nee Jones says that Dr. Wood had talked about space beams, that is not true. So, if he is interested in the truth of what happened to 9-11, the second time he spoke about that, he should have said, oh no, she didn't say space beams, she actually said directed energy weapon. Sorry, I made a mistake. So, people like him, and for example, you could probably say the same, same as Richard Gage, they are speaking untruthfully because they are not accurately reporting what has been said. All right? So that is one of my fundamental principles that it, that for judging how people are actually dealing with the truth of what the evidence shows. If they're going to make stuff up, and I've encountered this, and I've written several articles about it, and I can prove that people have made stuff up, and they've been corrected, and then they've continued with the untruthful statements. So if you want the truth movement, essentially, uh, you know, even though I've said that it's probably not a good thing, but if you want to be in a truth movement, you have to speak the truth. And if you get a, make a mistake, you should correct it. And in my uh, professional world that I come from, if someone presented 
bogus data or data they made up or said something about another researcher that was untrue, they'd be their their reputation would be toast for the rest of their life. Their career is toast because sure. that they've now you know taught everyone not to listen to what they say. I don't know why when that changed you know for the truther movement, but but uh, you know it's not the way professionals carry on. Indeed, but on the internet you can do that because you, yeah. if you if you say something under one name, you just adopt another name and build another website and become a an expert in something else, or maybe the same thing. Who knows? That's uh, another reason why anonymous posting uh, is irrelevant because they don't have a reputation to to uh, you know hold on to to answer to. And I think that you know all this that brings up the other issue of the way that internet forum noise is generated and much of it, not all of it but much of it is anonymous. So when people use the appropriate search terms, they come up with all this nonsense. Some of it can be quite well written, you know, it has good grammar, uh, good uh, sort of phrasing, and it sounds authoritative, but you don't really know what the motivation of the person is writing, you don't really know what their background is. So it can it can look and sound pretty convincing, but you know, most of the time you don't even know who you're talking to. And you know, th this is exactly why... I put all my contact details on my website and I encourage people to ring me up and ask me questions because at least then, you know, they've, they've got an opportunity to, to, to grill me and see if uh, I pass their grilling. You know, actually, it doesn't happen very often. I get very few people actually ever ringing me up or, you know, contacting me. Occasionally I do. And uh, in the, in the, for the most part, when they contact me, and I provide them with some information, they're usually happy with that, you know. But when you go mm -hmm. on a forum, you can just get anybody coming on there. And years and years ago, I don't know when it was, but this cult, I call it the culture of anonymity. The culture of anonymity was created. And people, even honest, you know, people with, with good intentions, they just seem to follow that, that culture of anonymity. And they, they, put, they won't use their real name. You know, they won't post any details about themselves and, and so on. So th th that has been a huge problem in actually allowing this situation of the internet connection and opinion to become the truth. Absolutely. There's a huge problem. It's not just with 9-11, of course. A lot of the other topics that I know you discuss on your programs, you can say the same thing about, you know. You have this consensus thinking, and you yeah. also have mob censure. In other words, if you yeah. post something that, that the group in the forum uh, disagrees with, you, they just uh, eat you alive. It's a logical fallacy to say that you know. A lot of people say, well, so many people, you know, the majority of of people say that the Dr. Wood is bogus. Well, uh, science isn't determined by popularity. You know, sure. it, it, I think it was Gandhi who said, even uh, you know, the truth is still the truth, even if just adhered to by you know, minority of one. Certainly, certainly. And, and as I think you know, the other thing on top of all of that is it almost goes back to what uh, the very negative uh, poster was saying a few few minutes ago that you read now, you know, saying no evidence that what what comes out of this is very very uncomfortable, not only because of the you know the horrible uh, you know murder of these people and, and all of those horrible things, but we hear all this talk, you know, things like climate change and you know, the, 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 our uh, irresponsible use of energy and all of this stuff, you know. But what 9-11 reveals is that it's actually far worse than that because we have a solution to those problems already. Well, somebody has a solution to those problems, not we. We don't have it. We're subject to control by the people that have that, that solution for themselves. So that is also an uncomfortable reality to have to deal with on top of everything else. And I think that's one of the sort of psychological barriers to people really getting a handle on this, because it goes against almost everything that they've encountered, up to the point that they discover that this is all real, and and and, and they realise that what what no, they're saying Santa is Claus actually exists. true. Yeah. No, Santa Claus exists. Yeah. No, Santa Claus exists. I yeah. want Santa Claus. Santa Claus exists. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to hear you. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's one that's one way of putting it. Uh, when you when you realise uh, something is not real. This is kind of almost the reverse of that. You know, you realize something is real. Um, 
But uh, I, you don't I, want it to be true. No, you, know, so no. you want Santa Claus to be real, so you have to reject reality. And uh, those are the enemy who speak of, of you know, not Santa Claus. And it, and it changes yeah. it changes the whole geopolitical uh, you know paradigm completely. And that's why it's, it, I think it's been covered up so so comprehensively. Sure. Yeah. I've got an uh, interesting perspective uh, on on that. I've been looking into this further and realized that you know when did I when when did my differences first show up right from the get go uh, because I you know I didn't watch TV and so forth either but I would notice things that my colleagues wouldn't notice and I wonder if it's there's a lot that has been implanted you know rah 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 we're the greatest country in the world. America wouldn't do anything to their citizens. They're great. We're, we're lucky to be in the greatest country in the world. And I was uh, remember this this particular day in third grade, the Weekly Reader, you know, this uh, child mm-hmm. newspaper, mm-hmm. It, it had this story about big bad Russians selling propaganda to to their citizens. And and I, I raised my hands and said, How do we know this itself isn't propaganda to us? And the entire class, as well as the teacher, laughed at me. Hmm. For asking that, like, how dare you ask that? We're we're in America, the greatest country in the world. They were already, you know, hoodwinked into that. Wow! It, it's just like a belief in Santa Claus that they aren't seeing reality. They have this belief system, and I think it's so important to see the world as a child before that age. You know, what what did you yourself think of? the world as a child, before it was contaminated and limited to what you were told you are supposed to see and think. And That's it's important. But, but also also with regard to, you know, those who, uh, like the, that last comment that you read, you have to ask what the objective is. Is it to find out what happened on 9-11 or is it to cover it up and divert away from what happened on 9-11? Would there be so much anger and hostility directed at both me and Andrew uh, if if someone was really interested in determining what happened? I think you know there may be also be an element that that person had come to the conclusion that what they'd already discovered was true, and there's a bit of kind of uh, difficulty there in accepting that uh, they they could have been fooled twice. You know, I had a bit of difficulty accepting that first. You know, you kind of think, oh, well, I'm smarter than everybody else because I've sussed out that 9-11 was controlled demolition and it wasn't anything to do with Al-Qaeda. It was some other agency that did it. And then somebody else comes along and says, no, 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 it wasn't controlled demolition. It was actually some type of directed energy weapon. They'll go, oh, what's that? And so, you know, maybe that that person is still stuck in that part mm-hmm. of the uh, process, as it were, or whatever you want to call it. I like that Mark Twain quote you have. Well, it, it was alleged to be. Yeah, you can read it out if you want, oh. but it was alleged to be Mark Twain. I was looking into this, and it wasn't. I don't think it was actually him, but yeah, go on. That's perhaps an appropriate point. Why don't you, why don't you read it? Well, the, the Mark Twain quote, the, the, which was, well, attributed to Mark Twain but, Twain, but I couldn't find out where he wrote it, is it's, it's easier to fool people than to convince them that they have been fooled. And I think that's true. Well, people people don't like to... They like to be popular. They like to be part of the group. And when you step outside of that group, uh, it's a very lonely position, I think. And, um, and of course, there has been a lot of, of um, uh, so-called sado-scientific uh, philosophy, philosophers who have... Uh, who know nothing about science who who people seem to give more credibility to uh, than somebody that actually knows what they're talking about, such as Dr. Wood. Oh right, I mean you know credentialism is a, is a huge can be a huge problem in this in this area, you know, and uh, somebody with claimed credentials, uh, you know, can uh, who can talk well, can uh, you know appear to be convincing, but sadly these people appear uh, not to want the truth to come out. They appear to be happier to help a, keep a you know huge horrible crime covered up um and so on and, and and that's what appears to happen yes very interesting all righty um getting back to this demolition idea the, the idea that uh, people people said well uh Danny Jowen- Jowenko? yeah Jowenko, uh, yeah 
who who said that uh that building seven was uh demolished and that uh he well the the person said Danny Jawinko was murdered for his knowledge of w t uh, t uh, w t c seven now how do how do we know that that was why he was murdered if he right. was murdered right yeah w- was he murdered and where's you know the proof to that claim it's it's a just a you know a claim that somebody's put out there uh and a claim is not evidence yeah that's now, true. Unless they can show some kind of documentation, it just remains as a possibility. It might, you know, it might be true. It may not be true. So people, you know, shouldn't confuse the the two. They shouldn't confuse, you know, supposition and, and speculation with what evidence actually shows. You know, what evidence there is to support a conclusion, as I, I try and say. The the evidence about Building Seven is uh, that it was even quieter than uh, the demise of the two towers. And it, the uh, amount that the, the ground shook that was recorded by the, at the seismic station was basically the, the equivalent of a jackhammer. It was a 47-story oh building. It was six times the the potential energy of the kingdom, the Seattle kingdom. Yet uh, the Seattle kingdom made a 2.3 when it was blown up. Uh, the building seven made a 0.6. On the, on the equivalent on the Richter scale, and none of the events on 9/11, the five events, you know, the three uh, buildings and the two uh, supposed uh, holes in the building, you know, plane-shaped holes, none of those had a detectable S or P wave. That's a signal that travels through the Earth. So how could you have buildings slamming to the ground or blowing up with bombs if? Uh, there's no signal that traveled through the earth, only a surface wave, which is what you would get if you just lifted the building up and turned it to dust. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so people, people have been told for years and years that Building 7 was a controlled demolition, and Larry Silverstein announced that it was a controlled demolition, and of course we're going to believe that. And um, so... Is he a, a scientist? Uh, <laughs> you know, no does he have a no, does he have a uh, career on the line? This is an anon. So, uh, but but uh, the controlled demolition. When would they have planted all of these the, the charges that would would have made it a controlled demolition? It I mean, doesn't matter if it it, it is it has charges or not. There, there's no evidence to support charges. But even more importantly, if it's a controlled you know in controlled demolitions, they remove everything uh, that isn't nailed down plus everything that is nailed down, any partitioning walls, everything. Because when the thing blows up, those anything in there becomes a projectile, which means they have to remove all the windows. And of all the video footage, I've not seen any removed windows. And because those window glass would become projectiles and decapitate people in the area. And that didn't happen. The adjacent buildings were machine gun fired, and that didn't happen. So the building was not prepared for demolition, as can be observed by no missing windows and again the you know the sound issue is not only the one again if you go and watch those videos of the alleged controlled demolition of building number seven you won't hear the characteristic bang, bang, you know, bang, 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 bang. you know sure it, it, the building actually as it goes down or goes away perhaps more accurately can be confused with what seems to happen in, in a control the initial demolition. The initial, the initial stages part. of it. Yeah, yeah. But, 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 but as well, it goes down further, you can see all this froth, you know, lather coming out from every which way. Sure. Yeah, and also, you know, the actual sound of it going to the ground, if it had all been chopped up into chunks, you know, if they somehow managed to rig this so that uh, the, uh, the, the the sections of the building were chopped up by these alleged uh, charges, then the, the sound of those, you know, bashing against each other as it came to the ground would be very, very loud, very, very loud. And you like didn't hear any of that. Threats. Yeah, because you were in a confined space. You know, this wasn't like in an, uh, an open area. This was among a group of other buildings. And all, any sound of that going bang, bang, bang as it was coming down, all the bits hitting against each other would have, would have echoed off all the surrounding buildings. 
So it would have been an enormous sure. racket. And even the NIST report, the official NIST report, said it was... I forget, can you remember the exact phrase they used? But I don't was, remember, but it was uh, essentially, uh, whisper quiet, but I was yeah. going to use that word. They they talked about, actually, one of the particular videos where uh, someone is being interviewed. This woman's being interviewed, and I've seen the video. Right behind her, you see the building start to drop, and I don't know if it's the interviewer or the cameraman or one of the same, where the building, as it starts to go down, the, the, the guy says, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. there's no indication. I mean, you, hear, you hear voices down the street talking, you know, conversations. Yeah. But you don't hear any bang, 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 bang. Unless it was added to a video that somebody created. Um, Possibly uh, so- later, yeah. Somebody in the uh, chat room said that there were crews going into the towers. Um, hang on, I'm just typing a question to this person. Okay. Uh, he said, but there were crews going into the two towers for months prior to 9-11, well, arriving in white vans through the night. And what I said was, how do you know there were crews going into the buildings? So, well, well, here, here's uh, uh, there's 25,000 people that, that worked in that building. I, I suspect there were people coming and going from the building all the time. And delivery trucks, you know, from FTD floors or whatever. Sure. I think if I can highlight that particular point and make a comparison, right. So, for example, uh, Dr. Wood has pointed out that the seismic signature of Building 7. I know the person wasn't specifically talking about Building 7 there, but I'll get back to that. And she has the seismic records from USGS to show that that is true. She has pictures of parts of the destruction of the World Trade Center 7, She has witness testimony from videos and from the NIST reports and so on. That person talking about these people going into the building, does he have, uh, you know, these teams, does he have photographs of them going into the building? Does he have photographs of the vans? Does he have written witness testimony with named people on it, with email addresses or phone numbers? Under oath. Yeah, Yeah, well, I mean, you know, some of the accounts that we've got are not under oath, but they are at least... We know who said them, and people can go and look at them on the New York Times website and other places. You know, so that so that person who said that we need a reference for that information as much as he's got. Whether you know who said it, where, which person gave that testimony, when it was recorded. You know, because all of the things that we've said, we can actually show you why and how we've come to those statements. Right. And that's the difference between evidence and speculation. Exactly. Um, and that is so true. And people trust speculation more than they do science. And I, I just have to look at the science. And it's just compelling beyond any speculation could Ooh, possibly could, be. I, I'm, I need to be sarcastic here. Uh, oh, but we can speculate. There are people changing light bulbs in the elevators. We need to investigate those people who are changing the light bulbs just in <laughs> case they had something to do with something that we imagined. Sure. And it, it's just, you have to look at the evidence. Cause and, and effect. <laughs> cause and effect, yes. I just It just boggles my mind that people are willing to listen to rumor and to speculation and <clears throat> and this, ideas by pe- p- paused by p- uh, p- uh, presented by people who have absolutely no knowledge of science or how it works. They and it just irritates me too. But there's when a people, there's a reason for this. Uh, you know, the way to solve a crime is you first have to determine what it was that happened, and only then can you determine how. It was. You have to determine what it is first before you can determine how it was. Because if you start out with with how it was done, you have to imagine what it is. So you're solving an imaginary problem. But the way to, to run a cover-up is to get people to argue about how it was done. They each imagine a different it that happened. And they argue round, 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 round. And they'll never, ever, ever solve what happened unless they first start out with what it was that happened. And, and, and so it's an excellent way to cover things up. And, and people don't have to purchase your book to to get an idea of what what the evidence is. All they have to do is visit your website, particularly the one, drjudywood.com slash WTC. Just scroll down to B and look look at the 41 issues that you address. 
Right. And and then make a decision. Make and then and then reevaluate and separate what you have presented from what they've been told and we've been told so frequently. It's it's it, it is like if you hear it a hundred times, it must be true. But that is not the case. Right. Do, do you, do, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, all I was going to say was essentially, and, and I know that some people don't have, you know, some people access the internet on a public from a public library, so they might only get an hour at a time or something, whatever it is. Or get the book so, through the library. Well, like, yes, that's the one thing they can do: get a book through Absolutely. the library. But I was also going to say that I send out DVDs free, you know, because I I do get people actually sending me small donations from my website, and I use those to send out DVDs free of charge to anybody that asks for them, you know, and I haven't had, like, huge numbers, so it's, it's been perfectly affordable for me to do that. So if anybody wants uh, videos of Dr. Wood's presentations, I've got several which, uh, you know, will, if you if you take the time to sit through them, you'll see all of this very clearly. So go, go on to checktheevidence.com and go on to the order DVD, stick your, an address in there, and I'll send you the DVDs, for heaven's sake. You know, it's that important to me. That That is really great. Uh, you've you've talked about the toasted cars uh, that uh, <clears throat> that were on FDR Drive. You talked you talked about the uh, the rail lines. You talked about the justification. Even if you just look at those videos and watch things disappear in midair as things are falling down, you can see they just disappear. Or they don't disappear. They they turn to dust. Right. They cease being a rigid object. See how you are. <laughs> I, I actually get accused of saying that things disappeared, and then you know the the the, the, the trolls say she claimed they disappeared. No, I don't claim they disappeared. They turned into dust. Oh, they magically disappeared. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, things get get twisted around quite quite easily. I know, but okay, but, they turned. But this is a right. This so is a question exact. of logic. You're so exacting, and that's what I love about you is that you don't. <laughs> People, you know, people who lie and make stuff up have to have really good memories. People who are telling the truth are just always very consistent. You're not going to ever change your story. You're not going to. You're not going to bring. I don't up, have to retract it. You don't anything have, I've said. Exactly. I haven't had to retract anything I've said. Exactly, because you're so consistent. You're there's, so consistent. There's an Don't expression, you see that, Andrew. There, there's an exp- Oh yeah, there's an expression which I heard uh, uh, another uh, witness say. Uh, to an amazing event that had happened to him, and he said, "I only tell it one way because it only happened one way," you know, and uh, that's that's what that's exactly what it is, you know. Yes, but that's exactly what it is. And if you look at the the photos right underneath in in Figure Three, Figure Four, look at all that paper. L- look at the paper strewn about, um, and <laughs> that was right after some big. Uh, Steel beams were, you know, heading towards that intersection as well as heading into onto Building Six, and exactly. you look in Building Six is an empty hole. Sure. And, and you don't see them there either. On uh, number one, the twin towers were destroyed faster than physics can explain by a free fall speed collapse. Uh, yeah, that no, note, I, note, I did not say fell. I said they were destroyed faster. Uh, they, yes. The ground shook for eight seconds. It would take nine and a half seconds to throw a bowling ball off the roof and have it hit the ground. Exactly. And if people scroll down, uh, they will see your BBE, the rate of destruction, the, the bowling ball example. And this is this is very compelling. I mean, you cannot argue with what you have presented, either on your website or in your book. It's just not, and no matter how many idiotic things people say about you, no matter how many accusations, no matter how many ridiculous things they say, doesn't you know, refute the evidence. It do, you can't. It, they never talk about this. They never talk about the evidence. They are always. It, it's always a personal, dare I say, uh, ad hominem attack. Yeah, that's what it is. She's pink with purple polka dots. I so don't believe her. Exactly. Sure. Sure. Whatever you do, don't believe her. Please, 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 don't believe her. Oh, exactly. Must be That's something worth worth listening to there. <laughs> sure. And if you have so many spont and it's not spontaneous, it was a deliberate group 
attack that that seemed spontaneous it seemed to come from various uh, various corners various uh, parties uh but it just was well it was just kind of orchestrated organized i would say and, and uh you have to ask you know, where did stephen jones go indeed uh, as soon as my book came out he's uh nowhere to be seen sure sure if we if we scroll down to H, dustification, and look at these photos, look, and look at the uh, figure 46, I mean, that is just incredible. Well, look at 49. Look at how something, how the, the spire. Yeah, those core columns. And uh, I, think, I think that's the top of stairwell B. Uh-huh. Because uh, uh, if the people below, yeah, that's something that a uh, few people mention is these folks in stairwell B, 14 of them, and plus two above them where they survived even though the building around them didn't. Uh, but the people in stairwell B looked up and saw sunshine and then walked out on their own. Yes. How how did that happen? If, if, a, if a building had collapsed, how in heaven's name uh, would that have happened? They weren't uh, crushed, and they weren't cooked to death. Exactly. The building didn't fall on them. And uh, that, um, Go ahead. And, that came, mm-hmm. and people say that, you know, oh, all the debris ended up in the basement. Well, how did it get to the basement? Did it take a detour, you know, go up, a, <laughs> you know, Church Street and over on VC and down the, in the, in the uh, ramp into the parking garage? I mean, how did it get to the basement to go through those people? Right. Uh, without crushing them. And what I was just going to mention about that particular testimony uh, with the stairwell B folks, and uh, a lot of that is in a video called, the, it's actually called The Miracle of Stairwell B. That's the actual title. And uh, I, I was aware of this video. I think I, I think it was made oh, 2005 or something, 2004. I can't remember exactly when it was made. Um, and I was very, I didn't really want to watch it at first because I thought, oh, no, it's just going to be more propaganda. But I did end up watching it after a period of time, and and the te- made by the BBC, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it was, I think it was made by Channel Four actually. It was, it oh, was, history, it, yeah. It was uh, I think again it had the, the version that I had of the British narrator, uh, so I don't know whether it was made by a British production company or whether they just put, you know, a British voiceover for for the UK onto it possibly. But uh, anyway, the, the testimony that's in that is is most compelling, and so I was actually quite glad that I ended up watching that because. I'd, you know, I'd, I'd known of this through Dr. Wood's evidence that she put together, but to actually hear them describing the events, it just 100% backed up all the other evidence, you know. And this is, uh, again, how this illustrates how a, a, a more and more compelling set of evidence has been built up uh, over time, you know, uh, that, that shows that, that everything that uh, we're telling you is true. The uh, the folks who were trapped in there thinking that they would be dead by the time anyone could, you know, dig them out because they're in the second, third, and fourth floor of the stairwell. So that meant there's 106 stories above them that was piled up on top of them is what they believed. But when the dust cloud cleared, they looked up. And I'll read uh, the quote by Jay Jonas. He says, I looked and said, guys, there used to be 106 floors above us. And now I'm seeing sunshine. There's nothing above us. That big building doesn't exist. He later said, these are the biggest office buildings in the world, and I didn't see one desk or one chair or one phone, nothing. Huh. Amazing. So, so, me... so, so in other words, just to summarize that, we've got seismic evidence that said the building didn't hit the ground in solid form. We've got witness testimony evidence that said the building didn't hit the ground in solid form. We've got photographs which show that the building didn't hit the ground in so- solid form. We've got videos of segments of the steel turning to dust before they hit the ground. Well, it sure. looks pretty much to me like the building turned to dust uh, before it hit the ground. And uh, how else do you get uh, ankle deep or, or you know calf deep dust all over southern Manhattan? Yeah, and how else do you end up with an un- undamaged bathtub, which you'd mentioned earlier on? Well, sure. if a bathtub just has a huge pile of uh, dust falling into it, you know, with most of the uh, rest of the dust, uh, you know, flying off Flying somewhere away. else, then that's how the bathtub survives and the, and the sure. path train survives. So all of the evidence shows you what happened 
and then you can go from showing what happened to you know the sorts of things that might have been involved in sure. causing it to and, happen. And for those who say that Building 7 looked like a controlled demolition, well, the t tipping top of Tower 2, even though it was like 35 stories instead of 47, it's, you know, similar height, looked just like Building 7. And it tipped over, but it stopped tipping. And it appears to violate the laws of conservation of angular momentum, but it doesn't. Uh, cease to to uh, stick by those rules. What that does is prove that it turned to dust because it quit tipping as a rigid body because it was now a whole bunch of dust particles yeah. that were still continuing to rotate. Okay. And that's how laws of conservation of angle momentum were not violated there. Sure. Uh, let me share some a couple of comments uh, from from the chat room. Uh, this is quite spooky, Deanna. The guests are clearly lucid, yet they are trying to dismantle the counter 9-11 theories by replacing physical evidence and eyewitness accounts with a lame, with a lame fabrication based on sci-fi theories. These two <laughs> are agents, no doubt. Okay, so you're agents. Uh, sci-fi theory, is that, are they calling uh, J. Jonas, the firefighter who survived Star Wars, as... as uh, you know, uh, he's an agent know. too. He must be. Oh, an okay, agent. everything's that's an agent. Can, that, that's all we can surmise from that well, testimony. If, if he want, if he wants that person, whoever he is, if uh, he can, uh, he can write to me, ad. Johnson at ntlworld. dot com, and he can ask me about my contract, which actually is with the Open University for doing disabled students assessments, and that's all on my website. So you know. Uh, if he wants to find out about that, then uh, I'll, I'll tell him everything he wants to know, or she, everything she wants to know. I don't know if it's a male or female, because obviously they don't say. So I'd, I really think that that's a kind of a desperate statement, and I don't even know what they're actually trying to, you know, what their counter theories are. And we're not talking about theories, we're actually talking about what actually happened, you know, mainly. Uh, like, like I say, you know, if you want to know what happened, you start you know, how tall somebody is. You you start out with a tape measure, not a theory. Sure. And yeah. what I've done is, is used what data we do have and do know. I don't fill in the gap with with guesses and hypotheses and speculation. That is not scientific. Sure. And also, they mentioned this phrase, science fiction. Well, I'd like to know exactly what science fiction about any any you know, the thing that we talked about uh, this afternoon. Uh, I can't think of anything that's uh, mentioned that's science fiction. Um, so again, that seems to be another mischaracterization of what's being discussed and people that can listen to the rest of this uh, and decide for themselves whether that's a mischaracterization or not. Sure. Uh, we know, you know, there's others that talk about science fiction, uh, but, you know, we don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, well, like, like, you know, saying that we talk about space beams doesn't mean we do talk about space beams. We haven't. Sure. You never, know, so, never mentioned space beams, ever. Right. And and that's usually, when people usually say uh, it's science fiction, space beams are science fiction, well, fine, go address the people who told you that. Sure. You know, not, 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 you know this isn't in my book. It, no one has, has found anything in my book that they have take, can take issue with. Sure. Another question, which you've already answered, what about the firefighters' testimony of explosions? Uh, there were many, and you already mentioned the the uh, the, yeah. the fire... Um, exploding uh, tanks, exploding pressurized tanks, tanks is things. the most likely explanation for those things. Um, there's an EMT who uh, who floated down some stairs, and and the only way she figured how that would fit into her view of the world was she must have died and God carried her down the stairs because how could she have floated down these stairs? Sure. So because that's what that firefighter, I mean, that uh, EMT said, does that mean that God carried her down the stairs? Maybe. Or, or you know, she was describing what she experienced. Okay. But her interpretation of it, that's in her interpretation, but she described what she had actually experienced. And that's actually sure. very similar to the 9-11 um, surfer that they called him, the Blaze, can't remember his second name, who came on the television about 18 months ago, didn't he, and told his account mm -hmm. of... He, he thinks he fell 20 floors, but that seems a bit unlikely. He floated down 20 floors, didn't he? Cause he said he was, the last he could remember was he was on floor 26, 
and then uh, the next, you know, no, two minutes later, yeah, or 22, and the next minute he was he was being rescued by firefighters or something at ground level. But but he was uh, no, he was on top of the stairwell B, you know, right. right Right where the hole was, where the, the people in Cerebral B looked up and saw blue sky, he was right on top of that that pile of stuff, yeah, right, and wasn't smashed. So he yeah. was sort of a, even a more extreme case than the firefighters. He didn't talk about being burnt to death. No. So in other words, we're talking about corroborating witness testimony of things like levitation and floating around the place, uh, an experience in the building coming apart. All that is in the the witness testimony record, and I can. Uh, Send them all the links to the files for that if people want to read it. We sure. need to separate interpretations from actual, you know, testimony of what someone experienced. Sure. And, and like uh, one of my favorite examples is Dan Rather, uh, not Dan Rich, but sorry, um, uh, Peter Jennings in the studio talking to George Stephanopoulos at the the site where George Stephanopoulos says, "Well, I'm going to ask you know." Peter Jennings says, "Where'd the all the rubble go?" Well, George Stephanopoulos Panopoulos says all fell down into the ground and was pulverized, evaporated. Does that mean he's testified the building evaporated, so therefore that's evidence that he evaporated? No, that's his interpretation of what he sees. He doesn't sure. see enough rubble. Um, uh, another comment. Uh, the firefighters with years of experience, knowing what exploding tanks sounded like, still said they were explosions. Yeah. Right, you hit a you hit a poke a balloon with a you know a pin and it explodes. You cook an egg in a microwave and it explodes. Right, but that doesn't mean that it is a bomb because bomb is yeah. bombs are kinetic energy and they would create a seismic response that that would show on the chart. Right, and none of them describe seeing what you know that identifying except for the only things that were identified was a fire truck that blew up and uh, Scott tanks that that exploded and things, sure. things of that sort. Again, what, if, pe what? if people want ahead, to actually uh, study the, 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 you know, I can direct them to all the texts of all the witness accounts and they can search for keywords like bomb and see what the firefighters actually said. Rather than claiming that they were describing bombs going off, they can actually get, do as I did when I started an investigation of the plane stories and that's in a separate article. It, it, and then Unless they, they can they, identify the the bomb, it's an interpretation they've made from the sound yeah. they heard. So right. there might have been firefighters saying it sounded like a bomb. The fireman doesn't say, oh yeah, I saw this bomb exploding and I could see that it was a bomb because I've seen a bomb going off and it was just like that. I don't think any of them say anything like that. You know, So people can actually read the accounts if they wish and determine for themselves what they actually said rather than what they think they said. Sure. Dr. Wood, uh, what what kinds of financial sacrifices have you experienced or repercussions for your uh, for well, your work? I, I like to stay with the evidence. Okay. Uh, because well, some, uh, somebody it, is saying, "Oh, somebody's paying these two off," or, or something to the to that. Uh, well, uh, I, I'll, I can talk. I can talk from my perspective in that. Um, uh, I can do this, I can spend time on this because of the work that I do. The work that I do involves me largely working at home and my, I'm my own boss and I can work to my own timetable. And so um, I can sort of basically, uh, you know, I've got enough of an income from the work that I do to allow me, and I choose to do this, to spend time on working on this sort of thing that we're doing now, essentially give my time to that. And uh, nobody is paying me to, uh, you know, do this program or to speak up for Dr. Wood or to write the book. I'm not being paid for any of that, right? So sure. I do it because it needs to be done as I see things from my perspective. And again, if people uh, certainly suspect me of anything else, then I encourage them to write to me and, uh, you know, I can uh, provide them with various, various contacts, uh, such as the place that I work, uh, you know, I can tell you all about that and tell you who to speak to to verify that I do work for them. If people wish to do that, I'm quite happy to tell them, you know, so I'll, I'll I, speak I myself it, on that. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. That's okay. I, I think that people get so invested in what they believe to be true that even when they are presented with contradictory evidence, evidence that is more compelling, that they are so invested in what they believe, and most people absolutely 
do not like to feel that they have been duped. So rather than reevaluate what they believe, when, when they are presented with new evidence, they prefer to remain where they're at uh, because, well, it's just more comfortable. Right. And uh, Andrew, there's another quote that um, we've, we've often used that um, that really, you know, kind of kind of cuts to this also. Um, when people think you make them think, they will like you. But when you really make them think, they will hate you. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And that's true. Absolutely. That that is. Uh... Here's here's some testimony uh, from Renee Davila. Uh, his boss asked him in this, this was a, uh, uh, what do you call now, it? Now, who is he? He was a, a first responder, an EMT, okay. who has sadly since died. But uh, it is in the debriefing afterwards, and this is uh, under oath, um, his boss asked him, you know, about his vehicle. Was it destroyed? Um, and he says, yeah, we were there, and the, yeah, the vehicle was destroyed. And the boss says, was it on fire? And he says, what? Boss then says, well, was it on fire? And he answers, fire? We saw the sucker blow up. We heard a boom. <laughs> now, his, his vehicle, his emergency medical vehicle, exploded. And is uh, another one, uh, another person says, yeah, um, uh, this, uh, that's... Uh, Renee's testament, but there's other things of explosions and, you know, vehicles flipped upside down. And there's really interesting things that they're, if you listen to what they say, not what you're told to think, but what these people actually say, it's it's quite uh, revealing. Now, why why would the EMT describe his his, uh, vehicle 219 as going boom? We saw the sucker blow up. We heard a boom. Indeed. Well, there's a lot of things that um, that certainly we can't explain, but I do believe in... Doesn't mean we your, should ignore them. Exactly. I, I do believe in your work. I believe in your book. I've read your book. I've studied your website. I'm not a scientist, but I have common sense, and my common sense tells me that even though this is not the popular way to, to go, this is the truth. I like a, it's, uh, another favorite Mark Twain quote. When you find yourself in the majority, it's a good time to pause and reflect. Ah, <laughs> yes. Oh, how true. Because you get swept up in it and, sure. it, and you start believing what other people tell you to, to believe rather than what you yourself believe. And I think that is actually one of the most powerful things of my book. I, I hadn't anticipated that. I was just telling the story. But what I've come to see is that People who are reading it, you know, they're sitting by themselves in their own room, their own space, not being influenced by anyone else. It's just them and the book. They don't have anyone to save face to. They don't have to to defend their ego that they were duped or anything else. And then pretty soon they can see just how much they were duped and learn how to see through it better in the future. And then they feel empowered by the end because they learn how to see what is there rather than what they're told to see is there. And that's going to become so important in in, in the near future. Sure. We we do get people writing to us, or I I certainly have people writing to me, they they can go through kind of a catharsis with this, you know, and uh, they realize that they've broken through another layer of deception. And my my goal in all of this is actually uh, the goal uh, that I have in my, you know, what I do for a living which is to uh, pass on knowledge and understanding. That's that's my goal in this. I don't expect you to believe. Ninety seconds. I want you to understand and know that what I'm telling you is true. All right, and I can't do that for you. It's something that you've got to do for yourself. But I can pass on the information and the sources, which will allow you to know these things or to not to know these things if you don't want to look at them. And it's, sure. it's the, per- the person's choice. Sure. Well said. Well, <clears throat> we we have run out of time. The two hours have gone by very rapidly. And 60 seconds. 
I've certainly enjoyed having you both on the program, and I hope that people will look at the evidence and not uh, believe what they have been told to believe. And those talking points came out r- immediately, immediately after yeah. the event. So thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you so much, Dr. Wood, for doing what you do, uh, even though it's not popular and uh, you get a lot of heat for it. Thank, thank you. you for doing what you do. Thank you, Diana. <laughs> yes, very, very much appreciated. Well, thank you so much, and we'll talk soon, and um, have a pleasant rest of the day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye Bye-bye, listeners.